Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. This is a, a good day. It's a day where we get to be where God wants us to be, worshiping him on our Sabbath. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look today at uh, Jesus and who Jesus is in his life as a human being. Because he doesn't just come in a vacuum. He comes into humanity as a person, a real person, in a real time, in a real place. So to begin with, I want to let you in on a little secret. Jesus was a Jew. Really. See, this simple fact is often overlooked. And the problem with that is you can't really understand Jesus unless you know something about Judaism. So, God comes into the world as a human being, and God follows a religion. What did the religion look like? It's really important for us. If we're going to interpret anything about Scripture, anything about Jesus, we've got to figure out, okay, so what did the religion look like in the first century in Israel where Jesus lived? Well, Judaism is based on a covenant. That's a promise that's lived between God and his people. Ever since Moses leads the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, God gives them his will for them. In other words, what he wants for them, the way of life he intends for them to live, he gives it in what Judaism calls the Torah. And the Torah technically It's the first five books of the Bible. The Torah, really, we translate the law. In other words, you can look at the law, meaning the law is God's ways of life that he intends for us to live because he designed us, he wired us, And he knows what it takes for us to live in a healthy way, the best way possible that he designs. So when we look at this law of God's way of life, we recognize that there's a really strong historical basis for this because God gives the people, the Jewish people, his way of life in the Torah, and this separates the Jewish people from all other cultures in the world. In ancient time, no one, no one is like the Jews. Later, when God's people build the temple in Jerusalem, the Jewish faith is established as a rhythm of life, teaching and observance of the law stand alongside the sacrificial rituals of temple worship in Jerusalem. And this Torah and the sacrificial rituals of worship in Jerusalem, these become the elements of Israel's life. That's good for a short period of time until There's a crisis. The Babylonian people conquer the Israelites. In 587 BC, they destroy the temple. In other words, they wipe out that rhythm. They not only destroy the temple, But many of the Jewish people in Jerusalem are captured and brought against their will all the way over to Babylon. From there, from that point on, the study and teaching of the Torah becomes the central part 
of Jewish life. Because there's no temple, the place of study and worship changes. It becomes the synagogue. And the synagogue is a place for worship, a place for prayer, a place for study, but it's also a social hall. It's where the people of the city would go for social occasions, for gatherings. It's not identically comparable, but we have a hall where we worship, where we pray, where we learn, and where we have social gatherings, where we eat together, and laugh together, and live life together. So the synagogue is very similar to our hall. Priests work in the temple. So the priests that are set up by God in ancient Israel, they don't have a job anymore. There's no temple. So what happens is a leadership role is born. This role is called rabbi. The rabbi is the teacher of the law, the teacher of the Torah. And this new way of living faith is changed once again because the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians. And the Persians say, <coughs> you guys can go back to Jerusalem. And not only can you go back to Jerusalem, I'm going to help you rebuild your temple. Cyrus the Great is the king of Persia who declared this. And it was a big deal. So they rebuild the temple. And they set up a new kind of political rivalry not on purpose, but it just happened. A political rivalry that grows between the priestly group, who has been restored now, to oversee the ritual and the sacrifice of the temple. This group of people are called the Sadducees. They work in the temple system. And then the group who has the rabbis, who teach in the synagogues and teach in the homes and so forth, these rabbis are the ones who teach God's law. The Pharisees are the leading part of the rabbis during the time of Jesus. So there's several Jewish groups. I'm going to be talking about these in, 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 in the future, um, in prime time, and I'm going to be talking about these various Jewish groups and so forth. There's several of them, but today I'll just mention the two, because these are the ones that are mentioned most often. The Sadducees, they're in charge of the temple and the rituals of worship and sacrificial system. They didn't have the same teachings about the law. They believe that the law is only the first five books of the Bible, and that's it. The Pharisees consider the Scripture all the books of the Old Testament. So what's the difference? Well, there's a lot of difference, some similarities. I think the main difference is this, the Pharisees believed in a resurrection from the dead, and the Sadducees didn't. The Sadducees think that you perform the rituals at the temple and so forth, and then when you die... You just disappear. And so one of the ways that I was taught to remember the difference between Sadducees and Pharisees is the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they are sad, you see. Get it? So you'll never forget that again. They're sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. <laughs> now the Pharisees are the leading part of the rabbis during the time of Jesus. They hold a strict interpretation of the Torah, which they would actually memorize. They follow the Old Testament, but it's based on a system of oral law, meaning laws that are passed down from rabbi to rabbi to rabbi, and these are like extra laws that are interpretations of what the scripture actually really means. So this system where important rabbis would comment on the scriptures, 
This is called the oral law because it wasn't written down until after the time of Jesus. During the time of Jesus, it's there, but only the Pharisees know it. And so they come up with all these rules and regulations that aren't in the Bible. The Sadducees would focus on ritual purity to make sure that the temple worship and the sacrifice was done properly. The Pharisees closely follow the ritual laws in the Torah, but they also include their interpretations of the rabbis of old concerning what the scripture says. The teachings of Jesus are closest to the teachings of the Pharisees. But the Pharisees are the guys that Jesus is constantly criticizing. Why? Well, because the oral laws actually take over. And they become a basis of legalism. They become a basis of nitpicking, following of specifics that are not called for in the Bible. They become the basis of spiritual pride, the basis of hypocrisy. There's a tension between the Pharisees' interpretation of God's ways of life and the ways of Jesus. So this is the background of much of what we call the Gospels. This is going on constantly behind the scenes. Today we're going to look at two examples. These examples are fasting and keeping the Sabbath. First, let's look at fasting. Next slide. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, Why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Hmm. See, the standard fast, a standard fast is you don't eat or drink anything from sun up to sundown. Okay, that period of time. No eating, no drinking. In the Bible, there's only one day of fast that God commands. This is the day of atonement. One day a year. The Pharisees added dozens of days that were not in the Bible. In fact, the Pharisees made five of those days official, even though they're not in the Bible. And then if you're like really holy, if you're really devout, there are also many optional fasts. For example, okay, now, pretend this is a scroll. That's where the Bible was written in ancient times. It's the Bible. Now, if I drop this Bible in first century Judaism, and worship, if I dropped it by mistake, and you know, me. <laughs> Good luck. No Super Bowl parties for any of you. Because if the scroll touches the ground, all the people at worship for 24 hours have to fast. No food, no drinks, no niners, no chiefs, done. I don't know if you have a Super Bowl party in mind, but you better hope that my hands are strong. <laughs> a rabbi has students who follow him. The rabbi teaches, but not just with words. The actions of the rabbi are also a way of teaching. The students of a rabbi are called disciples. The word disciple just simply means student. And these disciples would learn to do what the rabbi does. Not just learn to listen to what the rabbi says. So they are learning from imitation, much like children learn from their parents, the people that are raising them. They're learning from imitation as well as learning information. The rabbi's students would actually live for several years with their rabbi. 
In other words, if I were a rabbi in the first century, I would choose a few of you to live your life with me. And so you would go to my house and live in my house, eat the food I eat, go where I go, and everything else. That's the way that the rabbi taught imitation as well as information. So now in Scripture, what we see here is that John the Baptist has disciples. Who thought? John the Baptist has disciples too. Well, we know that. You see, because a couple of John the Baptist's disciples become Jesus' disciples. That's interesting. Peter and Andrew, for instance. Nathaniel becomes one of Jesus' disciples. But like the Pharisees, John's students follow the extra non-biblical fasts. And now, here comes the new rabbi, Jesus, and he doesn't follow the extra rules. In fact, he questions them. He says they're not appropriate. I mean, can you imagine? For hundreds of years, the leading people who you would consider the the best and the brightest of the faith, the Pharisees, these, were not bad. these are not bad people. These are the people that are looked up to. They're the heroes of the faith because they stood against all these foreign powers. The Pharisees themselves, here comes this whippersnapper, this young rabbi. He says, nah, this stuff is not, nah, no more. Now, he doesn't just say these rules don't apply. He questions them. In fact, he says that they're not even appropriate anymore. Not even appropriate, meaning they're wrong. Not just an option, they're wrong. And he does it in such a provocative way. He calls himself the bridegroom at a wedding. Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them. But someday, the groom will be taken away from them. And, and then they will fast. So Jesus is saying way more about, way more than just extra fasts aren't necessary. You see here, Jesus is actually teaching, using a metaphor that God is the bridegroom and Israel is the bride. That's all the way through the Old Testament. He takes this teaching that everybody knows and he turns it on its head, and he says, I'm the bridegroom. So can you imagine Jesus, this single rabbi, putting it in the face of every Pharisee for hundreds of years? He basically, not so subtly, is for the first time predicting he's going to die. And not just die in a fun way, like, oh, I'll fall asleep. And die of old age, you know. I guess that's not fun, but I mean, that, that'd be a good way to go, right? All right? No. Jesus says, I'm going to get killed. And they're going to take me away. And then he will expound on that one throughout his teaching. He'll t further and further until he tells them, I'm going to get crucified. So Jesus is saying, I'm God. Someday the groom will be taken away, and then you'll fast. Now, all of this symbolism goes over the people's heads. We know that because nobody's saying, wait a second, what do you mean? What are you talking about? They don't get it yet. Then Jesus uses two more examples to illustrate what he's doing. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine in old wineskins. For the wine will burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins will both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. Now, these are a bit difficult to understand for us today because, quite frankly, we don't really patch clothes anymore, do we? Some of you lived you know, like you're my age or older, so you lived in a time where you actually patched clothes. I remember having patches on my jeans. They weren't even my jeans. They were like my brother's jeans handed down. Thanks a lot, Mom. You look like a goof. You're walking around with jeans. You got a patch on them. You know, at least it wasn't like a smiley face or something like that. But here, the thing is, is that 
use your imagination, younger people. Use your imagination. <laughs> if you had an old pair of pants, I mean, you got old pairs of pants that have a bunch of rips, but you just don't put patches on them. That's a whole other story to me. I don't know why you're walking around looking like you're the poorest person in the world. You have rips all over your jeans. And that's the style. I mean, I get it, but I don't. And that's okay. Because several of my dearest relatives, including daughter and daughter-in-law, wear, wear jeans that have a bunch of holes in them. And it's like, I realize that's cool. Interesting, Nancy doesn't. Nancy, you're old. But here, use your imagination. If you've got an old pair of pants that have already been shrunk in the wash, and then they get a, a rip in them, and you've got to put a patch on, you don't put a new piece of cloth, because that's going to shrink. And if it shrinks, it's going to tear apart the hole that you sewed the new patch on. That's Jesus using homemaking 101 as an example. Isn't that interesting? Who's, who's sewing patches on clothes? That's kind of cool, actually. All right, how about the wine drinking? Well, we don't drink wine from wineskins anymore. See, in, their, in that day, they would use goat skins, sew them together, and that's where they'd put the wine. And they were fresh goat skins so that they would expand with the wine being fermented in the skin. So as the wine expands, or ferments and bubbles, the skins expand. What you would not want to do is put fermented, bubbling new wine into an old, dried-out skin because what's it going to do? Once it expands, it's going to burst, just like a balloon bursting, and you lose all your wine. So, what's Jesus doing? He's turning the Pharisees' world upside down. He's telling them that all their rules and all their extra teachings don't mean anything now. In fact, they're getting in the way of God breaking into the world in a new way. Religious rituals and rules that are not in the spirit of the word of God can become a real problem. There's so many examples of this for the last 2,000 years of religious rules becoming absolute, causing conflict within the Christian body, even though none of it's in the Bible. So many examples. Now, I'll start with a humorous one, and then I'll go to a serious one. The humorous one? Why are these offering plates here? I've been a pastor for several decades here. Right? Almost four decades. And we don't have offering plates in the front of the church in my first 25 years. Why are they there? Okay, if you're new to the church, you're probably wondering that yourself. Man, this church really likes their offering because <laughs> the plates are right in front. Well, I'm going to tell you why they're there. Many of you know I've had multiple leg surgeries over the years. And that makes it difficult or impossible for me to walk up these steps to the altar. See, the, the offering plates are always behind the altar. And then the pastor brings the plates forward and gives them to the usher. But I couldn't do that four different times when I had four different leg surgeries. So, because whoever's setting up communion and doing offering is being very loving to me, we would put communion elements on the altar railing, and we would put the offering plates on the altar railing so that I wouldn't have to walk up here. And that's how we would have worship for several months each time I have a leg surgery. Now you know. See how quickly something becomes a ritual? I can walk fine now. I mean, I can't jump that well. Ah, that's pretty good. But I can walk. So guess what? The communion elements are back here again. But I still keep the offering plates there, and I have no idea why I do that. I'm just so used to it. So from today forward, they're going to go back there, and I'm going to bring them up again. But you see, even the pastor gets caught up in a ritual about his own legs, and it becomes kind of like a religious thing for the whole congregation. So those of you who've joined the church or been part of us the last 10 years, my apologies. P 
people, including myself, were trying to be helpful, but this has nothing to do with any kind of a religious symbolism. Okay, that's what, it, that's what it's about. That's what happens. I think that's kind of funny, especially when I'm, the joke's on me. <laughs> now, sometimes this can become deadly serious. For example, in the Bible, there are female preachers, there are female leaders in the church. They are name by name. Some Christian groups have had women who are preachers and teachers for 2,000 years. But not all Christian groups. See, what happened is the largest Christian church, probably about 1,500 years ago, they decided only men could be priests. And so women were no longer allowed to be priests or leaders in the church. Other Christian groups that broke off from Roman Catholicism, like the Lutheran Church that we're part of, we break off from Roman Catholicism, but we keep the no women pastors, no women leaders. It took the Lutheran churches until the 1970s to change that. And some Lutheran churches in the world still haven't changed it. So we could see, if you take rules and regulations that you make up on your own, not from the Bible, then you can get in all sorts of trouble. Some are just humorous, like offering plates on the altar railing. Some are not so humorous, like women not being able to be pastors. Are you kidding me? And in particular, what if God calls a woman to be a pastor, and she goes into the scripture, she sees there's women pastors in the scripture, and then she goes, I can't do it because it's in the Bible, but you said I can't. Interesting. It's not a political issue. It's a biblical issue. This happens with fasting, and it happens also with something else, the Sabbath day. Next slide. God worked for six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. Then when God created people, the first day that people lived, it's so, it's so interesting, the first day people live, they get a day off. <laughs> the first day. And then after six days, they work again. But that's the pattern that God sets up. In fact, it becomes rule number four in God's top ten rules in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it separate from other days. That's what the word holy means. So I would say it's pretty important, right? I mean, it's four out of the top ten. Well, this is revolutionary in all cultures. No culture has done this in ancient history until Jew Judaism. No culture has ever done this. Ancient history, all cultures worked every single day. Your slaves, your servants, the people who weren't like the rulers who didn't have to really work hard, you know. It's revolutionary. The Jews are the first culture to say, take a break. Even servants. Everybody has one special day that they spend focusing on God and family. A time of rest, refreshment, and renewal. Then the Pharisees get a hold of this, and they turn it into something else. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? So here we see Jesus is being accused of breaking the law of God by having a snack of wheat grains on a Sunday, I mean, basically, I just, you know, it wasn't a Sunday, it's a Saturday, but just for modern times. No, you can't take that piece of grain off and eat it because that would be harvesting it. And that's work. And that's forbidden. Jesus will have none of this nonsense. He says to them, hey, haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and he broke the law by eating <laughs> the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. In other words, no, 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 no. Your greatest hero, King David, eats the bread reserved only for the priests, and he gives that bread to his friends, and they're not priests either. 
So you Pharisees don't get all bent out of shape about this. Well, that didn't go over too well. These extra Sabbath laws that the Pharisees had set up, they didn't go away. In fact, the strictest Judaism today, the most Orthodox Jews, okay, they still follow a whole bunch of Sabbath laws that have nothing to do with the Scripture. Work gets defined as any physical effort, not just your job. So, if you follow a strict Judaism, you can't turn on the lights on the Sabbath day in your house because flicking the switch, even pressing your app, that's work. So the lights are on before the Sabbath starts. You can't cook. That's work. So all the food is cooked before the Sabbath day. You can't carry anything at all or move anything at all outside of your own home. That's work. So walking itself becomes work. So you only have a limited amount of steps you're allowed to take on the Sabbath day. So what happens? What happens is this whole concept of the Sabbath is destroyed. Because I'm not getting too rested or too rejuvenated if I'm worrying about breaking some tiny law that's not even in the Bible. See, the Pharisees are just making stuff up. And even the strictest Jews today realize this. Did you know that? They do. So they realize that this is just making stuff up. So you know what they've done? They've made more stuff up. Here's what I mean. One of the extra Sabbath laws that's just made up is called the Eruv. E-R-U-V. And the Eruv, the law says you can't push or carry anything unless you are in your home. So on the Sabbath, you can't use a cane. You can't use a wheelchair. You can't push a baby stroller. So guess what was happening? Only healthy men were able to attend the synagogue. The women who had children, I mean, a woman could go if she didn't have children, but most of the women have children. So the women couldn't go with babies. And older people who had leg problems, they couldn't go because they can't go in a wheelchair or with a cane. How unfair can you get? So what happens is the rabbis declare new boundaries for what is considered your home. Existing fences and walls in your neighborhood are now borders for your house. They've been declared your home. And so as you walk to the synagogue in your neighborhood, the fences and walls that are there are the boundaries of your house. Yeah, but what if there's not fences or walls? Well, then what they do is they take fishing line and they string the fishing line between the power poles. And that area where the fishing line is and the walls and so forth, that's called the aruv. And that means, next slide, if you went around here in the valley and you look, it's kind of like finding where's Waldo. I want you to go out and look in the valley. I'll give you a hint, the southern part of the valley, kind of around Encino and Tarzana area, all right? You'll find these fishing lines on the light poles. So what they did is they made this your home. Here's the boundaries for the West Valley Aruv. Next slide. All right, so you see that? That's Tampa. This is the LA River. And then it stops. I guess they don't want you to go to the park. So it goes down here, here with walls and fishing line, down, to, down here to the 101, 405, and then this is Ventura Boulevard. But then we got this thing, which is really weird. Well, why does it have a southern detour? Well, I'm going to tell you why. It's a very religious purpose. This is El Caballero Country Club, which is a country club mainly for Jewish people. 
So, guess what you get to do on the Sabbath? You get to golf. Now, I would agree that golfing is a spiritual experience. So I'm cool with that. I am not criticizing that. So what is Jesus saying about all this? Well, again, he points to the fact that he's God and that he decides what the Sabbath's for. (laughs) Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the deeds of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord even over the Sabbath. There you have it. What Jesus says is important is important. The Sabbath is meant to have a positive impact in our lives. Not a bunch of regulations that make us nervous that we will take too many steps or that we will pick something up or or push something. The Sabbath is a time of rest and renewal, focusing on God and family. That's good, by all means. I mean, even Christians today mess that up. They mess this one up too. The fact that you're here this morning means you're one up over many Christians. Many of your brothers and sisters don't treat Sunday like you treat Sunday. They treat it like any other day. You're going against the grain. You are countercultural. You're a bunch of rebels. Did you know that? And it's a good idea you're here. Because God planned for you to be here. And it's not by accident. Thank you, Jesus, for opening our eyes to see that whenever human beings try to figure out more and more ways to restrict your power, your authority, it just gets messed up. We thank you for that Sabbath rhythm of rest and work and rest and work. We thank you for focusing on you and focusing on our families and extended families. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to stop us from looking at things that we think are so important when we live out our life of faith that aren't in the Bible. (laughs) Keep us within those pages. Amen.